Boy, that is not as the numbers that are in here. And there are lots of you this time. Good morning, believers. All right. Well, we've come to the last um, formal day of our camp. And indeed, I want to welcome you who have stayed with us and you over the internet because we've been getting lots of communications that many people are watching. And um, I, I, I indicated a number of persons on one occasion. I was told, hey, you didn't welcome this person or that person or this group or that group. But I want to say welcome every group, including the one here in Barbados. So good morning. Welcome to everyone. And as we go into our, this last study, I'm sure that it will not be the last study for you because what God has given us is so significant at this time. The messages he sent to us all integrate. He is the great hand behind all of the messages. And may we see it from that perspective and not see this person or that person or the other person, but may we see that God by his spirit has sent his word to revive his people and to prepare them for where he wants them to be with him forevermore. Is that your desire, brethren, to be with Christ forevermore? He's heard your desire. May you allow him to do that which only he can do. This morning we are going to finish, well, look at that lesson 8, chapter 8, in the little handout I have for you. Of course, you can't get into chapter 10, but chapter 8 will serve good enough for the time being. So at this time, just let us pause as we pray and get going. Our oh, gracious Father, holy and matchless is your name. You are really a wonderful Father. As we consider how you deal with us, only love could deal with wayward children that way. And Father, we rejoice to know that we have such a Father. We just want to praise you because you've done all, all through your Son on our behalf. And today, may our eyes, dear Father, be caused to look upon you through your Son and realize that you have an expected in force, the glories of eternity, you being our reward yourself. Be with us now and enlighten our minds, open our understanding, and cause us to grasp that which you have for us, that we may allow you, dear Father, to complete the work of grace in our hearts and in this earth. And Jesus will come again, and you with him, to rest on this earth forevermore. We look forward to that, Father. And we thank you for it, in Jesus' precious name. In chapter 8, on page 21, We come to a subsection called the investigative, sorry, the, investi the investigation determines who is worthy to live in the next eternity. So there's an investigation which will determine who will live in the next eternity. Of course, this is Matthew 22 here, but it's all touch it yesterday, but it's all already here, and we want to go a little further and explore some issues that our Father has for us. So once you have your booklet, the full book will come afterwards, we want you to turn to page 21, the heading, the investigation determines who is worthy to live in the next eternity. Part B, I go. The carrying out of the investigation reveals who of the human family will be worthy to live in the next eternity. Christ tells another marriage parable to this end. And like I said to you, Christ loved marriage. And so many marriage parables Christ has given to us. And this one is taken from Matthew 22, 2 to 14, but we're going to pick up some thoughts from verse 2, and then we're going to step down as far to verse 11 because of the specifics of what we want. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding 
and they would not come. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then this critical verse, verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. That is such a sad but true thought. God calls everyone, but everyone does not make themselves available to be the chosen. That's the reality. Only those who have on the wedding garment will be fit to live in the next eternity. This wedding garment is the righteousness of Christ, which is love. And Mount of Blessing, page 18, says that righteousness is love. And, and, and this statement comes from Manuscript Release of Volume 7, page 268. Listen carefully. In order to prepare for entrance into this beautiful city, we must now be clothed with the wedding garment, with the robe of Christ's righteousness, with Christ himself, to be clothed with it. It must be put on to you. And not only put on to you, it must be integrated into you as well. Going further, it says, this garment alone can fit up individuals to live in the next eternity as it both entitles and fits up for entrance into heaven. It is our title and our fitness. It is our covering and our development in Christ, really, in our souls. That is what the righteousness of Christ does. It makes you like Jesus. You can imagine that? You can imagine being made like Jesus? Wow! How many times do we want to be like Jesus and perform marvelous miracles and do big things? All God wants for you to do is to look like Jesus in character and he will give you his power. And you can do everything therefore then because it's not a risk to yourself or to God. So having the righteousness of Christ in the believer's soul, God is well satisfied because he doesn't give that righteousness for those who don't want it. As our title, it is freely imputed given freely to the sinner being his covering from the stern eyes and the malicious accusation of the enemy. Wow. You see, all of us, brethren, are wicked. Nothing good in dwelling us, you know, in our flesh. So what God has to do to stop Satan's mouth because Satan said, oh, you may, he do so and so the other day. I influenced him and he did it. He tell a lie, he stole, he committed this or he did that. And the only way that God could start to him off is putting the covering of Christ's righteousness on those who desire it. And that way, Satan mouth bursts because he can't accuse Christ. And when you're in Christ, you can't be accused. You are free because you're in Christ Jesus with his righteousness. So Satan mouth taught. It is taught when you are in Jesus. He can't accuse you because he has accused Jesus. He can't accuse Jesus. He knows that. You see the significance of Christ's righteousness? It covers and protects us from the malicious attacks of Satan. And Luke 15, 21 and 22 says, and referring out to this same story, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and that is us, and that is true. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But read with me now, verse 22, let's go. But the father said to his servants, what? Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. With well, this fellow, obviously, is naked. If you go to put on a robe, put on shoes and a ring, that's a naked fellow. So the father, the boy would say, Daddy, you know, I, 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 I just come back home and I do real bad and I really am worried to be called your son. Father said, who? Well, you are my son. You are my son. You are not worthy to be called my son. 
Look, servants, angels, you who hear these servants, you call angels, you know, are Zechariah. Zechariah and Joshua is told by the uh, angels that stand by, do something with them, cover him, give him a nice mitre, that he might be able to stand among those who stand by. And this is the same imagery here. Give him a robe, put a ring on his finger, and some shoes on his feet. And let him be the one, the critical one in all of what we're looking at. And listen carefully now as we go on further. As our fitness, that is, it is received by faith, the righteousness of Christ, that is, righteousness by faith now. This is now the imparted righteousness I'm talking about. The imputed righteousness is God covering you, even with your consent, for humanity's consent. We are covered by the imputed righteousness of Christ. But then you are filled with the imparted righteousness, which is the same righteousness, you know, but it's not a righteousness that you're choosing. You want to be that righteousness. It means, therefore, then, God has taken care of all humanity in one swoop. But then when you choose, he covers you specifically, and you are free from the accusation of Satan in a very significant way. And that is the same thing we talk a lot about at this congregation. That God has saved all men in Jesus Christ. But it's only when you accept that fact personally that you get the experience of personal justification. The same difference. So don't, don't look ask and sadly. Accept it in Christ. As a fitness, it is received by faith and transform the character of the sinner into the likeness of the character of Christ as he submits himself daily by, by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. So you see how God is working. His son, himself, the Holy Spirit, and his word for the purpose of the transformation of character. This is also seen in the story, and I extract this very interestingly as it came to my mind, by the eating and rejoicing which represents the receiving end of the food into the person, which is parallel to receiving the grace of God into our souls. So here was a party that his father made. A big feast was made. And everybody was invited, and son came and started eating as well. So the righteousness is like the righteousness is like the food that goes into your stomach. The righteousness goes into your soul as you participate in it. So that what it is given freely, there is something you must do in order to enjoy it. That is eat it. Just like the son was to eat the food for strength and everything else, the righteousness may be taken in that we might not only be covered by it, but we might live by it and grow into it to be like Jesus. That's how exactly this parable has significance for us. But going further, I say this is symbolic of... Brother Frankie. This is symbolic of the righteousness of Christ revealed by faith into the believer's soul or mind by the Spirit of God. Remember, uh, Paul gave it nicely here in Romans 14, 12. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what? But what, right, believers? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So that, you know, in Romans 5, 5, he also taught that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. by the Holy Spirit is given unto us. And like I said just now from Mount Abessin, page 18, righteousness is love. Therefore, the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the righteousness of Christ in our hearts. Because it's the Holy Spirit that brings to us all that Christ has given to us in himself. It's the Holy Spirit, that member of the Godhead that lives in human spirit. The Father and the Son are brought to us by the Holy Spirit. You see the importance of the Holy Spirit being the medium that brings all of God to humanity. And you looked up on the Holy Spirit of non-importance. Look again and see that except the Holy Spirit brings God and his Son to you, you don't have God or his Son. So the importance of the Holy Spirit cannot be overstated. 
And um, this that's wonderful thought. With the robe of righteousness covering the believer, there's also given him a ring as a sign of authority. That's what a sign was. Remember Daniel? He was given that ring by the king showing his authority. Now the king or father gives his subjects, his children, a ring to show that they have authority in his kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? You're not now only saved and barely getting to the kingdom. You are saved and given authority, man. Give a real authority over the kingdom and in the kingdom. But more than that, it says here, and also shoes, a sign act, a symbol of the gospel of peace, which brings salvation. So all that really has been given to the believer is all that Christ has himself. So the believer has all in Christ and all of Christ, praise the Lord. Not only all in Christ, but he has all of Christ. This will make you excited. This will make you happy to be really a son or a daughter of God. You know, uh, I know what it says, we live so low, so near to the low lands of life that we don't really elevate our thoughts to where Christ has us seated on his throne, you know. We keep on down here upon this earth and Satan and say, gotcha. Once your mind is kept down here, you are trapped. You know, if you are in the dirt, you're full of dirt. But if you live in the heavens where Christ lives, you're full of light. It is time that we must truly arise and let the light shine because it has risen upon us. And start really being wallowing in the mud, which is not spoken of us. The light is spoken of us. We are God is brethren. So the righteousness of Christ is light. How can we continue as we have been going, especially now we've come to this particular time that we will be faced with in the messages, especially the camp book? The parable of Matthew 22 also illustrates an investigation into the lives of all those who claim to be children of the kingdom. This investigation must be carried out to determine who truly have on the wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ, thus fitting them to attend the wedding and to live in the next eternity. You know, we are the guests at this wedding. So then... Matthew 22 gives it really nicely. It says, who can enter here and who is fit to continue there? The record book of life in heaven, which contains the names of the professed people of God, is used in the investigation to determine the attendance at the wedding and their fitness to live in the next eternity. So here are these books. Everyone claiming to be God's children but for their sake and the universe's sake, an investigation must be carried out. And I quote here now um, Revelation 20 and Daniel 7 to confirm that particular fact. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But that is the dead. Those who will be alive to see Christ coming in the clouds of glory, they have a judgment to pass as well. And in Revelation, in Daniel 7, 10, we have here another um, illustration of what went just now in Revelation. The prophet speaking of the same investigation says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. This investigation is that of the professed people of God only. It is open and transparent, and the individual's own personal record, his memory, is also used to corroborate the accuracy of the records in the books of heaven. This is amazing. You know, um, our memory contains every single thing that you've ever done in your entire life. I am told that a, a, a hypnosis could come to you 
and put you under that spell of hypnotism. And you can begin to reveal what you know from the time you were conscious enough at a one-year-old child. Even though it is not conscious with you right now, they can pull it out because it's buried somewhere but not lost. That's the point I'm getting at. It's buried, you know, but it's not lost. And the book, your memory, God uses. Listen carefully then to what um, we are given here about that particular statement in Zechariah chapter 5. This is very curious, very interesting perspective that we have come to learn. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. We can find what that curse is. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Here's the curse. The sin is all there, you know. And sin is always the curse. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that swear falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Tremendous imagery here brought out. So what really is Zechariah telling us? Let's go. This flying roll represents the holy law. Of course, it is holy and just and good. Romans 7, 12 tells us that. With commandment number eight, quoted, thou shalt not steal, that is mentioned, refer to on one side, which is man's duty to man, and commandment number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, which is him that sweareth, refer to on the other side, man's duty to man. So here we are now seeing man's duty to God. Thank you. Here we are now seeing in actual fact the law of God which enters every man's house. Every man's house. You. You'll be judged by that law that enters your house. Whether you're a thief, a thief, sorry, or a swearing person or any other type of person. It is the moral law which is the standard of righteousness that judges whether or not the righteousness of Christ, Christ has been received by individuals and are therefore worthy to live in the next eternity. The law cannot give life, but it tells you whether or not you have life. That's amazing, eh? You know, I like to tell people, I can't sing like the fancy singers here, but I like good music, I can tell them it's good. I can tell if you're going off to or you say nonsense. The law, like me now, doesn't give life, but it tells you if you have life or not. That's the amazing thing, you know. Because in actual fact, the law itself contains the very principles of God's life. And if you are not stacking up like that law, which can't give you life, if you're not stacking up like that law, the law can say, listen, you make a joke, man. You don't have the life of God. So it's important for us to understand why the law doesn't give life. It can say whether a person has life, the eternal life of God or not. Very important. Now, for he that saith, do not commit adultery, saith also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do as what? They that shall be judged by what? The law of liberty. So God's law is called a law of liberty. So when you are in obedience to that law, you have been liberated by Jesus. So the law of liberty does not condemn you. As a matter of fact, applauds you for having the life of Christ Jesus. And you are at liberty. But I want to say something here. You notice that it says, if a man don't kill... But yet he commit adultery, he ain't get away. Some people believe that if you don't do the big sins, you could do little work, little, little businesses, and you're okay. 
The law of God is very broad. It's as expansive as God because it is as eternal as God. And therefore, it enters every operation of your soul and is able to condemn you if you're not covered and filled with the righteousness of Christ. That's what the law is all about. The law is just like God. It's a transfer of God. Therefore, it says what God says. But going further, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus are the only ones who will be fitted to live in the next eternity. And we have Revelation 22, 12, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. Now, I'll go into the next section now very quickly. The investigation also determines who is worthy to rule in the next eternity. This is a very interesting one. Is God really worthy to rule in the next eternity? Or is Satan correct? That God manipulates people. Like how, he, like how Satan claimed he did Job. Man, you give Job all kinds of things. You protected Job. You want to expose him to me to let me show you whether or not Job really trusts you. So God is on trial because Satan challenged God and suggests that God is a liar. So the, interna the, sorry, so the universal court is now brought into vogue, actually to determine if God who says he is this way is really that way that he says he is. And I want you to, in spite of the stifling heat, to see if you could concentrate, because I'm getting here too as well. At the start of the great war in heaven, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, one of the current cherubs, Lucifer, as he was then known, sought to overthrow the government of God, thinking to set up an alternative, better government. Bear that in mind. Not only he was seeking to set up an alternative government, he was claiming that his alternative government is better than God's government. Remember that. But the prophet Isaiah tells us, in that thought, this is brought out. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weakened the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend where? Into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. A creature, you know. Now, this challenge to God's government by Lucifer led him to become the leader of the revolt with one third of the angels of heaven siding with him. So here we have God, perfect in all his ways, a perfect kingdom. And one of his, or the highest of his um, created subjects, challenging him, saying, that his way is not really altogether perfect. What will God have to do now with this person? He's perfect. He's challenged. What will he do? Now, this challenge to God's government by Lucifer led him, like I said, to become the leader of the revolt with one third of the angels of heaven siding with him. But further, this revolt occurred right at the heart of the seat of God's government, right at the heart of it. Because Satan, according to the next statement, Ezekiel 20, verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and God said, and I set you so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That is where Lucifer was. Right, looks, he was at what we would say the interface between eternity and time, if you understand what I'm saying there. That is, here's God, and Satan was just there. But of course, God does in eternity, and he in time. But listen, the challenge to God's government was transferred to the newly created earth, Revelation 12, 7 to 9, 
And with the entrapment of Adam and Eve, it intensified. So Satan not only got one third of the heavenly angels, he now has a planet that he can live on. And whoever come about, that was his plan. Will God, with all his power and might, rise up and destroy them all and make a new star? Or will he stick to the principle he espouses with which he runs his government, the principle of righteousness, that is, love and freedom? What will God do? We are told by God's servant and piercing of prophets. The angels watch to see God arise and destroy them. Because the angels said that they deserve destruction. So she says they were watching now for God to rise and destroy humanity. And more than that, when I said here, just in that statement, destroy them all, the entire earth, the animals, the trees, everything, including man as well. But, tremendous now, we are brought to a statement here from Revelation 19, 11 and 12. Is he going to destroy them or function the way he says he functions? And Revelation 19, 11 and 12 tells us clearly that. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And white is always an important symbol. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So the one sitting on this white horse is called faithful and true, and he makes war and righteousness. Amazing. And he was, called, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And this is the, the expression of the armies of God. They're in white, they're fighting righteousness. They're war, yes, they're war against sin, but only in righteousness. And that's why, why God is giving his children righteousness as a covering that they might war against Satan, self, and sin, but only in righteousness, only in love. Because that's the only way this war will be won, by love. So if you are not warring in love, you are not covered with the righteousness or filled with the righteousness of Christ. If you find yourself cursing and fighting and quarreling and miserable, it tells you, or it should tell you, that you don't have the righteousness of Christ, and therefore your warfare is not really going to be successful. The only successful warfare is the warfare of those who, like Christ, wars in righteousness. In love. Do we war in love or do we war in our own selves? And that's the key. This word of God is the same one that is the way of God in the sanctuary. He came into the earth to the man Satan, claimed by Satan as the, as the father's representative and successfully waged war in righteousness against Satan and his associates, including the human self will which was always seeking to entrap him. In our flesh, the human self-will was always trying to direct Jesus away from the will of his father. But that was kept under by his submission to the father, and therefore only the will of God was done in Jesus Christ. And that is what is needed, brethren, for us to war in righteousness. Other than that, we will be warring in our human flesh, with our human ideas, fighting along certain lines and really thinking that we are doing God a service. But like Christ had to say in Luke chapter 9 from 56 to the disciples who once said, because Jesus was going to Jerusalem and his face was as if he was passing Samaria, the people would not receive him when he wanted a lodging. And John and those other guys said, Master, do you want us to call down fire upon them as Elijah called down fire upon the captains of the 350s? And Christ with pain looked at them and said, you know not what spirit 
you are of. They thought they were doing quite such a wonderful deed by telling about Elijah. It meant that Elijah's spirit was a wrong spirit at that time as well. You're challenged there, aren't you? Christ said, you don't know. Once you want to hurt, harm, destroy a person, it is not the spirit of God. And that is a lesson we can learn from Luke chapter 9, 56 to 59. Anytime you want to curse and get on and rip down and mash up and break up and tear up, it is not the spirit of God. And don't fool yourself that you can do, we can do these things and it's the spirit of God. We really know what spirit we are of. And I can tell you it's the spirit of the devil because of what Christ was suggesting. All right, going a little further, I go down to the next paragraph. Which says, in the great war, God's on trial, and it will be determined if he is fit to rule the next eternity. We quote Romans 3, 4, which says, God forbid, yet let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So yes, God is on trial as well, because Satan charged God. Satan said he's telling lies. Satan said he's not as good as he says he is. Therefore, God has to answer the charges for the entire universe and for us as well. And he involves us in actual fact. And um, the entire universe now is waiting to see this display of God's matter of fact, At Calvary, I should say, slipping a couple of lines down. At Calvary, the entire universe saw the ultimate display of God's love Versus Satan's selfishness at Calvary. They saw how a creature treated his creator and how he would have treated the entire universe if he had gotten his way. Let me tell you something. Do you take it easy? If Satan had managed to get his way, we'd be in big trouble forever. You saw he treat Jesus, especially at Calvary and Gethsemane, particularly at Calvary. That is how Satan would have treated the entire universe if he had his way. Thank God that God is who he is. That we are not brought subject to that vagabond, that murderer and liar. Look at what a vagabond is. I, you need therefore then to contemplate what Christ, God and Christ has really accomplished for us. But at last, Revelation 15, 3 and 4 says, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art what? Holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. What you do is shown clearly, made manifest. Now, we're now going to something I want to get to very importantly, because we look at numbers, we look at time elements, and so on. It says the seventh and final feast of the Lord is that of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a feast of rejoicing. This being the seventh feast is symbolic of the complete and perfect redemptive work of our high priest. This feast occurs during the millennial reign of Christ and his followers in heaven. For immediately after the sixth feast, the day of atonement in which we are, the investigation the sixth feast of investigation of his people, Christ is seen coming in the clouds of heaven to take his church to himself. So after the sixth feast, no more feasts on this earth. At this time, the earth will be in a dreadful condition, having been destroyed and wasted by war, earthquake, famine, etc., and the seven last plagues. There will therefore be no time or place for rejoicing as the Feast of Tabernacles calls for. And look what it says here in Leviticus 23, 13 to 40. That should be Leviticus 23, 13 to 40. It doesn't have the um, scripture written there. It says, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you are gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall receive, and you shall rejoice before the Lord, your God, seven days. So that is what the Feast of Tabernacle calls for. But in the antitype, 
That doesn't happen. At the end of this feast that we are in now, because the earth is in devastated state, God has to take us someplace where there is peace, tranquility, where there is rejoicing, and that is in heaven. It is instructive that the seventh feast of rejoicing will occur during the 7,000 year of humans' existence, not on the earth, but in heaven. This teaches us something of biblical numerology. I want you to follow on here now because I'm going to show something that might have been new to you, but the principles are known to you. The creation of the earth was accomplished in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested, making a complete week of seven days. We are aware of that. The sixth and seventh feast of the Lord tells us that the length of the experiment of sin and the rest that follows is bound up in the numbers six and seven. Follow me. With man's creation occurring on the sixth day, six is associated with man. And the rest of God being celebrated on the seventh day, seven is associated with the perfection of God's finished and complete work. Sure, you're with me there still. The creation story teaches us that the principles of love and freedom were used by God in creating the earth and all that therein is from nothing in six days and rested on the seventh day and this before the entrance of sin. With the entrance of sin and intelligences, intelligence that is humanity, with freedom of choice, it takes a long time to restore all things to their original perfection. So once sin has entered, God now has to seek to get back to its original perfection, what he had made. That being so, we are told by the apostle, this is Peter now in 2 Peter 3, 8, something very significant in my estimation, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. This text, along with Psalm 90 verse 4, which said the same thing, teaches what I call the day thousand year principle, which has similarities to the teaching of the day year principle of Numbers 1434 and Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. A day for a year is what that was. And now in this context, it's a day for a thousand years. Is what I'm saying here. But let me go further. God worked for six days to create and then rested on the seventh day. In the original creation, which has its parallel in the restoration of the earth and all that therein is. The parallel being God works for 6,000 years after the entrance of sin for the restoration of the earth and all that therein is, and afterward will follow the 7,000 year rest in heaven. And that's the parallel I see. The principle of work followed by rest was enunciated by God himself from the creation of the world. The scripture says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Then the other verse says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, I am suggesting to you that the day your principle was applied in a particular context, and to me, this day, thousand year principle, can be also applied in this particular concept context in which God is working to restore that which has been all mashed up by sin. And it took God six days to make the literal first creation, but it takes him longer, and in this case 6,000 years or thereabout, to restore the original creation to where it was. You see, because of intelligences and choices and sin, it now takes that kind of time. And since there was a rest day as well with the six creation days, there's also a rest period after God has worked this great work of restoration, even a thousand-year period. 
And of course, they say that Christ speaks of redemptive work for humanity also holds the principle. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me. What is his day? The night come after me, no man can work. All right, I'm going to have just five more minutes, so I want just to finish on, well, at the end there. Listen very carefully now. John in Revelation 24, 2 to 7 speaks of the 1,000 year on this wise. Verse 2 says, Satan is bound a thousand years. Verse 3 says, he is not able to deceive the nations for a thousand years. Verse 4 says, the righteous reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then verse 5 says, the rest of the dead, as the wicked, live not until the thousand years were finished. And then verse 5 reiterates that the righteous, those in the first resurrection, reign with Christ a thousand years. That is found in verse 6. And verse 7 says, Satan is loose for, from, out of his confinement at the expiration of the thousand years. So between verse 2 and verse 7, we have this thousand years motive or theme being repeated six times. What really is the significance? Is God trying to tell us something? Or is it just, well, yes, that is it. I believe that something more is being said to us. And listen what I am mean by that, what I mean by that. I ask the question, but what are these 1,000 years, or to what are these 1,000 years related? If you follow me just now that at rest, after the six days of creation, God rested one day, and that to bring back creation to it was, it takes 6,000 long years because of sin, and human intelligence who have choices, and then this 1,000 years will come after it. I found something very interesting in God's servant's writings. I just want to share a little bit of it here to you. It comes from Great Controversy 659 to 661 in that period. Listen to what she says. I say, but first of all, I say, but to what are these 1,000 years related? That's the question. Careful analysis of the following passage by the servant of God shows that they are related to and come at the end of the 6,000 years. The 6,000 year great war, which has been carried on between Christ and Satan, and which Christ has been working for the redemption of humanity and Satan for the destruction. And we are clear on that. Now, this quote, as I conclude For 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He has made the world as a wilderness and destroys the cities thereof. And he opened not the house of his prisoners, that is the grave. For 6,000 years, his prison house has received God's people, and he would have held them captive forever. But praise God, blessed be the name of the Lord, glory, hallelujah. Listen to that statement. But Christ has broken his bonds and set the prisoner free, or praise the name of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Is that excitable to you? Oh, come on. Then she says, for, and then after I have other things she written, she says, for a thousand years, Satan will wander to and fro in the desolate earth to behold the results of his, his rebellion against the law of God. At this time, the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And what I'm saying to you believers is this. You see this sin situation? I believe clearly to my mind from the word of God that it has a 6,000 year give or take experience in which Satan was working to destroy but Christ was working to deliver and has delivered. And immediately after that, the thousand years will finish. Therefore, the six and seven feasts tell us the end of this world system comes after the six feasts, the Day of Atonement. The seven feasts now, a thousand years, will be spent in heaven. And I see how 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 or thereabout, and um, Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, is clearly expressed to show the day thousand year principles. Of course, we know we don't use that expression or haven't yet learned to use it. But certainly, it is very significant to my mind that it has also a bearing for us here at the end of time. So God grant us this 
period expires, which you don't know when it will expire, because it will be cut short in righteousness, that the righteousness of Christ will be in God's people, on God's people, and in God's people to the extent that he will say, here are they that keep the commandments of God, obey the law of God, and have both the testimony and the faith of Jesus. Brethren, I recommend you to that God who has, through his son, worked for and is working for our eternal salvation. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, that you have been going ever deeper with us to show you, dear Lord, your love, to show your hand to us, that you long for us to be back home with you where we have traveled for almost 6,000 years as a family, and you and your son are working up to this time to bring us back, dear Father, to our lost status and our lost home. May we cooperate with you. May we cast in our lot, dear Lord, that this work might not continue any longer, the work of sin and degradation. But that, like you said to John, dear Jesus, that you will come quickly. May John's response be ours. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, we pray in his precious name. But I think that um, it is workbook time. I was told, I don't see, oh, Doug is coming.